So hi, everybody. I'm Bruce McKay, Chair of the Department of Biology. So while today's event is on a virtual platform, I would like to begin by acknowledging that Carleton's campus is on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. Ottawa is home to many Indigenous peoples and communities who represent other diverse, distinct, and autonomous Indigenous nations. So before I um, introduce the speaker, I wanted to make sure that I first thank Rima Matar and, and Katie Elliott for coordinating community, communicating today's events. And I wanted to point something out that's very important. Today is a special day and it's part of a special month. It's the International Day of Women in Science, uh, sorry, Women and Girls in Science. And February is Black History Month. So today is an ideal day for this Faculty of Science ACDI event. I would like to highlight the important work of the Carleton Gila team, a group of Carleton students, Nadia Rahim, Oriolua Adowu, Isabel Hotnot, Maha Ali, Emily Scott, and Marwa Zubedi. The name of the Gila, te um, Gila team derives from the name of a cell line called Gila cells, which itself derives from the initials from Henry Adelak's name. She was a young black woman who died of cervical cancer in 1951. Her HeLa cells were taken from her biopsy without her consent or the knowledge of her family. These cells became the first immortal cell line in culture and the most widely used cell line in the world. Innumerable discoveries were made using these cells. The Carlton HeLa team achieved three goals. They successfully established the Henry Lacks Scholarship in Biology. Our biology lab was renamed the, the Lax Lab and a commemorative plaque in Henrietta Lacks honor was created. The plaque was digitally unveiled this morning and we look forward to its placement outside the Lax Lab when public health measures permit a worthy celebration. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest, Dr. Arjumand Siddiqui, who was invited on the recommendation of the Car uh, Carlton Gila team. Dr. Siddiqui is a social epidemiologist a professor and a division head of epidemiology at the Dalai Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. She holds a Canada Research Chair in Population Health Equity. She holds cross appointments in public policy and sociology at the University of Toronto, as well as an adjunct appointment at the Gilling School of Global Public Health at the University of North Carolina. Dr. Siddiqui's research centers on understanding why health inequities are so pervasive and persistent and what can we do about this? She engages with government and non-government en entities, including the governments of Ontario and Canada and the World Health Organization. Today, today she will talk or present a talk entitled The Health of Black Canadians in COVID-19 Times and Beyond. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Siddiqui. Thank you so much, Bruce, and thank you to Rima. Thank you to the Hilia team. Thank you to everyone who uh, was kind enough to invite me today. It's really a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm going to put up my presentation and go through it, but I'm also going to monitor the chat in case people have questions before I'm done. And then I understand, Bruce, that there'll be a, a, an opportunity to uh, take questions after as well. So let me share my screen now. Uh, no, what do I want to do? I want to view the slideshow. There we go. Okay. Um, so, you know, the title of my talk um, kind of um, foreshadows the fact that we both have concerns about um, the health of Black Canadians in with respect to COVID-19, but that this is really an ongoing issue. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about what we know around the issue of racial inequities um, in COVID-19. Well, you know, it really started with um, reports in the media early in the pandemic, sort of in that um, March, April range. We started hearing reports about particularly personal support workers and, and, and workers at long-term care homes who were dying uh, of COVID. And this is a, these are pictures of three of the earliest reports that we got uh, in Ontario of personal support workers who had unfortunately passed. And so the question was whether there was a more systematic pattern happening. Um, but early on, we weren't able to figure that out because we just simply did not have data on race. 
um, that we could sort of uh, associate with COVID records and figure out if there were systematic uh, disparities happening. But elsewhere in countries like the US, certainly evidence of racial inequities in COVID-19 were coming on like gangbusters. And, and that's uh, not surprising at all, as I will uh, talk about momentarily. So um, early on, you know, people started to say we should know what's going on and we don't because we don't have the data. And uh, the chief medical officer of health at the time said, well, you know, we don't really need this data because the WHO says we don't have to collect it. And, you know, we care about everybody. And so, you know, there's really no reason to collect this data, which was an unbelievable statement. Uh, all of uh, uh, health is really premised on the idea of understanding who gets sick so that we can understand why they get sick. Um, and so many of us, community organizations, uh, grassroots workers, uh, uh, Councilman Joe Cressy in Toronto, many of us academics, we started to write about this issue in the newspaper and other places, speak about it, that you know we really did need the data to figure out what was going on in the pandemic. So eventually Toronto said, look, we're going to collect and, and kind of map our own data. And so they started with um, a neighborhood map of COVID cases. So they said, uh, based on postal code, they figured out where the, um, the neighborhood was of residents of people who were contracting COVID and dying from COVID. Um, and uh, if you look at the pattern, the darker shades are the of the uh, shades with the higher levels of COVID. And they're all concentrated in the Northwest part of Toronto. And that is the region of Toronto that is densely populated with black working class people. And so actually what you ended up with was not only an inequity, but just a remarkably stark, horrifying inequity. Um, at various points in the pandemic, the, the the case differential has been about tenfold between black working class neighborhoods and the central part of the city, which is mostly white and wealthy. So eventually they moved from neighborhood level data to uh, data on individuals. So the neighborhood level data essentially comes from uh, linking census uh, variables on uh, ethnicity concentrations to COVID data. But this time around, they actually asked people how they self-identified when they were tested for COVID. And um, this is the result of that data. And you can see in the green bars, the share of the population of Toronto represented by each racial group. And in the gray bars, the share of the population uh, represented amongst COVID cases. And so where you see the gray bar exceed the green bar, uh, it's an indication that the uh, subgroup, that the racial subgroup is overrepresented amongst COVID cases. And indeed, Black people were effectively the, the most um, impacted by COVID, uh, followed by South Asian groups and other groups. But if you look at the total share of uh, racialized people compared to whites, it's, it's uh, as I'll point out later again, it's remarkable. It was sort of upwards of 70 or 80% of COVID cases um, were amongst racialized people, again, with Black people being uh, the hardest hit. This is similar data from Montreal, just to show you that it's not just a Toronto thing on the left hand side in particular, you can see that as the proportion of black people in a neighborhood goes up, so does the proportion of COVID, less true for South Asians, but also a, a gradient present there. We've been doing some work to try to uh, figure out some of the spatial and the temporal patterns of inequalities. And this is just a graph to show you that um, if you look at different measures of inequity, income inequity, deprivation, ethnicity, ethnicity was actually the strongest marker of inequity uh, in COVID. Um, so let's then say that um, I think for all intents and purposes, we've established that there were strong racial inequities. And so now the question is why? Um, and, um, you know, there was uh, talk during, during this time about a lot of ways to get at the why question. Uh, this is a snapshot of an article from CBC where David Naylor says, you know, I'd really like to know what's going on and I'd like to know how much of this disease burden for black communities is due to socioeconomic conditions and how much of it could be genetic, uh, which is an 
all too unfortunately common uh, refrain, which is when we see racial inequities in health, we wonder if they are genetic. And I, I'm here to tell you, as many of you I'm sure know, in, that they are emphatically not genetic. Um, this is some data to kind of show you how and why uh, race is not genetic, and so racial health inequities are not genetic. Um, this is a uh, study that was done in Illinois, and they looked at the birth weight distributions of three groups. Um, moms who had babies uh, and the moms were born in Africa. Uh, one group where moms uh, were Black but U.S. born and the third group where the moms were white and US born. So that African born group were um, immigrant moms who gave birth in the US. And um, this is the three distributions mapped out. And if you look at the two overlapping distributions, those distributions are the African born black moms and the US born white moms. The most dissimilar distribution is the US born black distribution. In other words, if we really thought race was genetic, you would imagine that the African-born Black moms and the U.S.-born Black moms would have similar um, birth weight distributions, but they do not. And this indicates that there are racial inequities, but those inequities cannot be attributed to genetics. Similar story, uh, this is a study where they looked at diabetes in the Pima Indian population, quite a sort of isolated um, group, so not even a lot of intermixing, and so kind of a nice genetic case to study. So Pima Indians had their society bisected by a border during his, some uh, historical processes. And so part of the Pima Indian community lives in Arizona in the US and part lives in Mexico. And as many of you may know, there's always this search to find out why there's such high rates of diabetes in indigenous people. There are thrifty gene hypotheses, again, lots of genetic uh, explanations put out there for uh, higher rates of diabetes in, in uh, indigenous peoples. And yet, when they looked at this study, they found that uh, there were large differences, even within one particular, as they call it in the US, Indian community, uh, the Pima Indians. So Mexican Pima Indians had one fifth the diabetes rate of US Pima Indians. Really, really tough to put a genetic argument uh, onto that. Um, this is a graph that kind of shows how uh, I think uh, we commonly think about race and ancestry and the human population and variation in that population by race compared to what's actually going on. And this is uh, work done by people who uh, did the Human Genome Project. So on the left is what we often think, which is that you know each of these kinds of circles are, are a racial ethnic group. And that yes, of course, we're all human, so we all overlap in some places, but we really have these sort of distinctions genetically. And their point is that actually what it looks like is on the right, which is that almost there's almost total overlap. And when there isn't, it's not systematic. It's not discernible. So if you gave me a genome, I could not tell you the race of the uh, in individual. So um, there are countless ways that we can think about what's happening with race and why it's happening uh, during COVID. And one way to think about this is to say, uh, what was the situation coming into COVID? What did we know? Okay, so we knew that it wasn't genetic, despite the fact that people are going to keep hope alive with that uh, hypothesis. We know that's not what's going on. So what is going on? Well, we have decades and decades of data and research to suggest that uh, there is a very discernible cause for virtually all racial health inequalities of which we know. And so when I say there's decades of research, I'm not joking around. In the US, they have a lot of data on race. The UK collects a lot of this data and we know what's happening to health outcomes. So COVID-19 is by no means an anomaly. Rather, it is unfortunately a perpetuation of a very clear pattern. So this is uh, data from the US on infant mortality by race. And you can see that Black people have the highest infant mortality over time. What's uh, actually even more remarkable in some ways is that even as infant mortality has fallen for all groups over time, as you can see, it has, 
the relative gap between blacks and whites remains the same. So as we've been able to fix to some extent uh, infant mortality, we haven't been able to do anything about the inequality in infant mortality. This is Canadian data on uh, birth weight. And uh, it's a little tough to, to sort of decipher this graph, but I, I'm going to leave the slides with uh, Rima and company and, and uh, they can feel free to um, uh, uh, send them to you. This is a study by Jay Kaufman at McGill and his colleagues. And essentially it says in both uh, Canada and the US, so just like the US, Canada also has these birth outcome disparities. And so the relative gap between Canadian black uh, babies and Canadian white babies looks very similar to the gap between US black babies and US white babies, but our absolute levels of uh, uh, mortality and our absolute birth weights uh, are favorable in Canada. So the relative gap is the same. The absolute gap looks better in Canada. This is hypertension. So again, you know, we have data on almost every outcome of which you can think from birth to death. So infant mortality, birth weight. This is hypertension uh, in Canada and the US. So Canada's in the red bars, US in the black bars, sorry, in the blue bars. And um, you can see, I'll just turn your attention to the um, odds ratios for Blacks. So in Canada and the US, you see uh, that Black people are at higher risk for hypertension, even though it's slightly a larger gap in the US than in Canada. HIV, uh, one in seven people in uh, living with HIV in Canada are African Caribbean or identifying Black as Black in some way whereas one in 35 people living in Canada uh, identifies African Caribbean or Black. So these very disproportionately high uh, HIV outcomes as well. Um, this is mortality and life expectancy in uh, the US. We unfortunately don't have data like this in Canada. Um, so again, what's really striking is that as things get better, mortality dec declines, life expectancy uh, rises, you still don't get much bang for the buck uh, in terms of the gap closing. So as I said, you know, decades of research uh, to figure this out. And the idea is that across all those outcomes I showed you, um, we think there is a sort of unifying pathway that's explaining all of it. So um, that's what I'll take you through now a little bit. So if you think about health outcomes, health outcomes can be caused by any myriad factors, environmental exposures like exposure to the COVID virus, uh, to coronavirus, uh, health behaviors that affect things like diabetes, your eating habits, your exercise, and so on. They affect heart disease and so on. Um, whether you experience physiological or psychological stress, things like having chronic stress that affects your blood pressure, chronic stress that might make you depressed or anxious. Um, access to health care, whether you have sufficient health care uh, that maybe doesn't prevent health, health outcomes from occurring in the first place, but may help mitigate harms from health out from uh, ill health. And so you could have any number of pathways that lead to any number of health outcomes. But it turns out when you look at racial disparities in health, what's ultimately happening is that those factors are essentially triggered by a fewer set of fundamental factors, what we often call social determinants of health, things like your income, uh, things like your uh, housing conditions, your job status, and so on. Um, and they also occur from stressful experiences like discrimination. And so the idea is that racial disparities are happening because people who are uh, particularly Black uh, and other uh, 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 racialized people are disproportionately uh, able to access socioeconomic resources, and they're disproportionately likely to experience discrimination. Why? Because they are uh, they are sort of subject subject to a set of institutional and structural conditions that perpetuate disadvantage for socioeconomic conditions that perpetuate exp experiences of discrimination, and so. If it's true that health can be expressed on the right-hand side in a lot of different ways and a lot of different outcomes, 
but it all seems to be triggered by a small set of social determinants of health and that people who are racialized, particularly Black people, are more likely to have to experience disadvantage and experience the stress of discrimination, therein lies your answer to why we have racial inequities in COVID and in virtually every outcome you can think of. Because if virtually every outcome lends itself to socioeconomic conditions and stressful conditions in general, you're going to see it play out over and over again. And in fact, um, some people refer to this, this concept as a sort of root fundamental cause uh, 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 process. And so the idea is, yes, we can intervene on exposures, on health behaviors, on access to care. These are all important things to do, but without fixing access to resources, experiences of discrimination, the structural conditions that produce those things in the first place, it's very difficult to do anything about it because as soon as you intervene, for example, on health behaviors, uh, institutional racism will reassert itself through some other pathway, through physiological stress or environmental exposure or access to healthcare. But intervening upstream is where you really have a chance to track, tackle racial health inequities and the reason we see COVID-19 inequities is because we haven't tackled those, those structural inequities. So let's talk a little bit about how this framework relates to COVID in particular, to give you a sense of how to apply this uh, in, 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 to a particular health condition. So if you imagine um, the, the, uh, the fact that COVID-19 really, is really caused by exposure to the SARS-CoV virus, um, that is kind of like an environmental exposure. And the question is then, if you go upstream, how is this exposure being patterned? Well, what we learned during the pandemic is that the exposure was heavily patterned by whether or not people had to go to work, whether they had to work outside the home and therefore be exposed to uh, indoor spaces and shared indoor spaces and therefore sort of increase their risk. And so the question is, how do you explain uh, the fact that some people had to be exposed uh, uh, and work outside the home and others didn't. Well, um, if you look at um, this sort of idea that um, people who lived in uh, largely Black working class neighborhoods were more likely to get COVID in uh, uh, the top left-hand corner, the top, the top graph and the top left-hand corner of the graph here, as I showed you before, um, it's kind of not surprising because if you look at these bottom two graphs, they show that pattern of income disadvantage, of socioeconomic and labor market position disadvantage mapped on. So in the um, bottom left-hand corner, um, you see there are uh, three um, uh, kind of shades of uh, neighborhoods for Toronto. And uh, the shades, the orange shades on the outer edges of Toronto um, are, uh, are neighborhoods that are lower income, whereas uh, the, the central, center part of the city is uh, the richer part of the city. And uh, you can see that that maps directly onto um, the um, uh, COVID, the sort of COVID shading on the top um, corner. Not now. Um, sorry about that. Um, so on the right hand side is um, the proportion of people in these na neighborhoods who are black. So this is COVID cases on the top, black people uh, density on the right and income density on the left. And you can see this all maps on top of each other. So the lower the COVID risk, the higher the income, the less black people. The higher the COVID risk, the more black people, uh, the lower the income. Um, and so if you go back to this uh, figure that I showed you earlier that uh, showed individual level COVID data by race, um, you can also see this panning out at the individual with individual level with income. So this is uh, shares of COVID cases in Toronto by income level uh, in the gray bars and the proportion of that income level represented uh, in, the, in the city by the green bars. And so again, you can see disproportionately high cases of COVID uh, in the lower income brackets. And 
you know, these are not different people. These are also layer data. It's just data split out different ways. On the left, split out by race. On the right, split out by income. And if you put that together, you can start to see that the story is that more racialized people uh, are in lower income groups, uh, groups that were in essential service positions and were therefore more likely to be exposed to the virus. There's nothing genetic about it. It's a social phenomenon, a disgraceful social phenomenon, whereby you see uh, racialized people in more precarious positions during COVID times. This is a graph from StatsCan that shows uh, personal, the distribution, racial distribution of personal support workers in Canada. Uh, and you can see that Filipino and Black people are vastly overrepresented uh, amongst personal support workers in Canada. Um, if you look at how this sort of plays out in general socioeconomic terms, so I'm sort of taking you through uh, the fact that you saw uh, higher essential service work and less stay at home work and in uh, racialized groups during the pandemic. If you look generally, you see this too. So um, this is data from the University of Toronto where I work. And if you look at the proportion of Toronto School Board Black and Indigenous students who did not enter University of Toronto, it's more than 90%. And you can take a look at the groups, the numbers for other groups. Uh, um, uh, of students. And then if you look at those who came but did not graduate, there's no data for Indigenous people, but for Black people, it's over half. These are all processes directly related to structural and institutional racism. Uh, and we have very good evidence for that, as I'll show you shortly. This is just a sort of irresistible tidbit from our neighbors to the South to give you a sense of the flip side of racism, which is what some people call privilege. I'm not so sure I like that term because uh, it implies you don't even work for it. But uh, I think I think white people have worked pretty hard for their privilege. Um, and this is data from Harvard that finds 43% of white students at Harvard are either legacy, meaning they're there because their parents or grandparents went there, they're athletes, or they are related to donors. 43%. And the same study found that 75% of that 43% did not meet the bar for admissions without belonging to uh, these uh, affirmative action groups, essentially, is what they are. Uh, this is StatsCan data on uh, differences by race in uh, income, in median income. And uh, if you look at the uh, difference, it's it's a seven thousand dollar difference per year in median income, which is significant. This is Toronto data that's been parsed out by uh, 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 race, and again, you can see uh, the distinction between uh, white men and women on the left, and uh, particularly black men and women on the right. So again, you know, these are things that happen not by accident, certainly not by choice, certainly not by culture, or any of those features that are often bantied about, not by genes. We have very good evidence that this is intimately related to how our education systems function, our labor markets function, and other ways that institutional and structural racism is embedded in our society. Um, this is a... Uh, um, picture of an article from, uh, I think it was two summers ago now, where uh, the government of Ontario decided to end grade nine streaming because it found it to be such a discriminatory process. So there's no interpersonal uh, story here. This is not about a, just a teacher being racist. This is about a process, an institutional process that was baked in with racism to the point that they had to dismantle it uh, entirely. This is a uh, graph that shows evidence from a labor market discrimination from Toronto. So uh, Philip Oriopoulos sent out fake resumes to real jobs and figured out if your resume had a, a white sounding name, an Asian sounding name, et cetera, were you more or less likely to get a call back if your resume otherwise looked identical? And they've done this with black and white names in the US. And if you look at the right hand side, that kind of uh, uh, a red, red uh, dotted bar is the disadvantage that Asian names have in the labor market 
if they also have foreign education and foreign experience. So that's over 60% less likely than people with white names and white education, uh, sorry, Canadian education and Canadian experience uh, to get a call back. But if you look at the left-hand side, the solid red bar, it's even more alarming because that is the bar that says that, that people with Asian sounding name that have Canadian uh, education and Canadian qualifications are 30%, still 30% less likely uh, to get called back for an interview. So um, a lot of that COVID story is about the immediate labor market issues, meaning the immediate notion that Black people in particular and other uh, uh, racialized people uh, were more likely to be essential service workers, to work low-wage jobs where you could not work at home. And essentially, it was the chickens coming home to roost, that that's the jobs they had before the pandemic, and that's what put them at risk during the pandemic. Um, there's also this issue of discrimination, as I mentioned, and particularly discrimination in the healthcare system. Um, and we do have data that suggests that particularly uh, Black and Aboriginal Canadians are much more likely to experience uh, discrimination in society. Uh, take a look on the right hand side. These are sorry, these are all uh, forms of everyday discrimination, as the scale is called. So this is um, whether you're uh, you report being treated with less courtesy and respect, receiving poorer service, being treated as not smart, and being feared by others. And the light blue bars are the bars for the odds of Black people compared to white people. And you can see that in every case, they're at least two to four fold more likely to experience that form of discrimination. Um, this is uh, uh, Leonard Rodriguez, who was one of the first uh, personal support workers to die from COVID in Toronto, or at least one of the first to be reported in the media. And um, there was a whole story about how he declined and went to his health declined and he went to the emergency room and he was, you know, sort of patched up and turned back a, a back, turned back around and not admitted now. We don't know in this case whether that was the wise thing to do, whether uh, the way he presented uh, was, a, was a way that it, you know, anyone would have been sent home after being treated. But nonetheless, it sort of makes you wonder uh, because we do have good evidence from the US that uh, people are treated very differently in very elemental ways uh, in the healthcare system. So we have some evidence of that as well, though the main issue really does seem to be about essential service work. Here's another uh, sort of indication of racism in healthcare. These are lineups uh, for vaccination in uh, uh, that Northwest region of uh, Toronto that I showed you. These are uh, again, Black working class neighborhoods where uh, vaccination uh, clinics and so on were uh, very hard fought and were largely, the successful ones were largely conducted by, uh, for example, the uh, Jamaican Canadian Association, who did a much better job than the government of getting people um, vaccinated. So that's kind of where we are. Um, we're in a position where we understand what's happening. Um, we understand that effectively, whether it's COVID or diabetes or HIV or depression or what have you, the fundamental reason health inequities are occurring is because uh, people who are black and brown and racialized in, in some way are experiencing racism, which shapes their lives and their opportunities for health. And so no matter how that translates into what health outcome fundamentally you're talking about the same uh, processes occurring. Um, and so part of the question is, what do we do now? What do we, what do we sort of, how do we think about this now? Um, particularly because COVID was just another example of uh, something that's happening. So let's talk for a second about the role of uh, data. So um, as I mentioned early on in the pandemic, uh, we had written about the need for data and eventually this data was produced. And so we now know with systematic data that there are racial health inequities in uh, Toronto and in Ontario uh, writ large. Um, and so part of the question is, oops, sorry. Part of the question is, did this make a difference? 
And I have to say, it's hard to say that it made a difference. Um, there are parts that made a difference. I think it was helpful in getting some resources for vaccination clinics. Um, but much of that underlying dynamic has not changed. And I very often get this question, what is the point? Why are you, you know, barking about data when it doesn't do anything? Nothing changes. You collect the data and then we kind of move on. And I actually don't have uh, um, a, a rebuttal for that, uh, uh, you know, at least a, not a good one. But what I will say is that I still think the data are important. If for no other reason, I think we deserve to live in a society that has public documentation of the truth of what's actually happening in our society that cannot be dismissed by anecdotes, cannot be dismissed by uh, narratives from one person or another, but collects a systematic picture of what's happening in our society. What we do with that, I don't know. Uh, I wish we did more, but I, I'm being sort of honest here. I, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, uncovering the unequal burden of COVID did as much as we would like, particularly given what I've told you, which is that the real dynamics are about the fundamental causes. So even if we eat away at vaccination for COVID a bit, we eat away at this, we eat away at that on the edges, we still haven't moved the fundamental processes that kind of make this whole uh, system tick. Um, I also wanna talk about the role of prior knowledge. Um, so as I mentioned, we have this very large body of work that informs how we think about racial health inequities and gives us a good running head start to understanding what's happening. So much so that even when we didn't know what COVID-19 was or how it was caused, if you remember, we didn't mask at the beginning, we thought it was dropless, we, we didn't realize it was airborne, even if we didn't know any of that, but you told someone who's a social epidemiologist like me that there was a disease on the horizon, we probably would have told you there is an extremely high probability that there will be racial health inequities in that outcome, in that health condition, even if you don't tell me what the pathway is that causes it. In COVID times, yes, it was about essential service work, but it could be any disease with any mechanism leading to it. But the fundamental issue is that we place Black people in particular and other racialized people in positions to be disadvantaged no matter what the outcome is and how you get it. We do that because we make food expensive and so it's expensive to eat well. We do that because we make uh, uh, you know, the discrimination in the job market penetrate the kinds of jobs people are doing and then it's stressful and terrible. Um, you know, we do it uh, uh, because we uh, perpetuate discrimination in every facet of society, and that's terrible and stressful. We do it in the healthcare system. I, I can go on and on. We have epigenetic evidence for this. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And so it doesn't really matter what the pathway is, what the outcome is. The fundamental issue is the social economic structure of our society that is always disadvantaging Black people, irrespective of the health outcome. Um, so I just wanted to put this up. This is uh, an op-ed that we did many years ago after Toronto Public Health released a report, and this kind of is case in point. Um, so Toronto Public Health in around 2005, I believe, uh, did a report where they documented income-based health inequities in Toronto and noticed that there are large health inequities. And they decided to make health inequities a central focus of their work. And 10 years later, they went back and re-studied health inequities and, and re sort of remapped them. And so after 10 years of a program to fix them, uh, they were very dismayed to learn that, in fact, those health inequities had only increased. So imagine being in, in a public health agency and saying, oh, we're going to tackle health inequities and we're spending 10 years doing it, and then you find out the outcomes are even worse. Uh, 
Well, they were even worse during this time because not, there's not much that a public health agency can do to deal with the fundamental factors that were driving health at the time and really always higher rents, lower income, precariousness at work, all of these things that are not in the purview of a public health agency. So a public health agency cannot create a, a quit smoking campaign that will compensate for how, uh, 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 how damaging it is to live in economic and social precariousness. And so, you know, we knew this, this second report where they saw that, uh, you know, things had gotten worse, that was 2016, I believe that report was released. So we've known for a really long time that this is how social determinants of health work and health inequities work. So the fact that it happened again in uh, for COVID after everything we know, it, it's hard to know what to do with that. And let me just say, even if you leave equity out of the picture for a moment, um, you know, the majority of cases in absolute terms, 72% over the whole pandemic occurred in racialized people. That's staggering. So 72% of the absolute cases occurred in racialized people, and yet we did not do what we needed to do uh, for the majority of cases. So this is not just a question of Black people being disproportionately represented amongst COVID cases and COVID mortality. It's that the absolute burden was highest in Black and other racialized groups. That's staggering to me, the fact that we still couldn't attend to uh, uh, what was happening, even though it was the largest story in terms of the demographics of the uh, uh, pandemic. So, you know, on that happy note, um, for me, the question is now what? And I'm not sure what the answer is, but I do know that the answer requires a complete reimagination of what we do and the scale we do it at uh, and our reasoning and our rationale for how we handle health and health equity and how we think about the health of Black Canadians now uh, and uh, in the past and into the future. And I think it, it begs us to have a real reckoning and I'll leave it at there. Thank you very much, that was fantastic. Um, for those of you in the audience that have questions, there's two ways that you can ask questions. You can type them into the chat, and there's also a Q&A section. We have a couple of questions now in the, in the Q&A. Do you have that visible to you? I do, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, the first one about the reluctance to collect racial data we see in many sectors. Um, yeah, how do you move past that? One possibility is that the dam has broken, that we are now collecting data and so it will only spread. There are many community organizations that are advocating for this and it's possible that this is what we needed to kind of uh, uh, start us on a road. Um, that makes me think though, that if it doesn't work, the dam just doesn't break this time. Uh, the strategies that worked were multiple um, sectors of society insisting that this needed to be done and insisting that this was a problem and pointing out how and why this was a problem. Um, you know, I think there was a, a level of indifference that uh, um, was clear at the beginning of the conversation about collecting race-based data that simply um, sort of had to wear away because people from the community um, were, were sort of uh, uh, very articulate about how, um, how damaging it was to have that sort of attitude towards understanding what was happening in our society. I hope that helps. Um, okay, the second question, is there a way for medical school education to address discrimination towards racialized patients? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, in some ways, yes, there is. And in some ways, I think there's a bigger story here. 
So um, actually, University of Toronto has a program, their medical school has a program uh, to make sure that Black health uh, issues are sort of represented in, in medical school curricula and that uh, there is a panel, a group, which I'm a part of as well, that reviews what's happening uh, in courses at University of Toronto's uh, medical school and kind of tries to figure out um, you know, whether there's frankly racist content uh, and, and whether it, you know, there are ways to sort of uh, change anything that needs to be changed. Um, so that's one thing. I think there, it needs a deliberate kind of uh, um, approach to uh, uh, medical education. The second thing is I think uh, we, need, we need more Black doctors. We need more people who represent the patients that they're taking care of and have some kind of sense of uh, what those patients might be going through. I don't think representation always means that you will get the desired results, but it often does. I think there's no question that um, discrimination in education and so on has led to um, vastly insufficient numbers of uh, Black doctors, and we need to fix that pronto. The last part is less encouraging. Uh, and that is that I think the racism that Black people experience in the, in, in the medical system is really just a microcosm of, uh, of what they experience in the world because medical uh, uh, staff, doctors, nurses, uh, orderlies, et cetera, are also a rep representation of our society at some level. And so they bring their own attitudes, biases, et cetera, with them into the hospital. And so, um, you know, I think there is a broader story here outside the medical system. In other words, addressing racism within the medical system requires addressing it outside the medical system as well. Um, oh, thank you very much for that nice comment. Um, what do you think is the first step to addressing the economic inequalities in the Ontario context, especially with the provincial government prioritizing economy over people? A great question, and I, I'm afraid I don't have a great answer for you. I don't know what the first step is, but I can tell you what I think is that um, we need a, a, a large range of bold steps. I think that's the issue. I think we've been um, backsliding for the most part, so it's not even like we're taking small steps. That's so. The first first issue is we've been backsliding on these issues. I actually just got off a conversation earlier where I mentioned uh, the basic income pilot that died in Ontario. Uh, and a lot of us uh, were, were very excited about the basic income pilot because had it gone through and been successful, basic income would have raised the incomes of people on social assistance. And it would have also meant that more people are covered by social assistance policy. But as one of my uh, former doctoral students astutely pointed out, if you look at the amount that you would have gotten uh, under the basic income pilot, again, much more than what you were getting currently on social assistance, um, it didn't even match what you were getting in the mid 90s before we had severe cutbacks. It didn't match, it adjusted for inflation, it didn't match what people got on social assistance you know, in the 80s and 90s. So, you know, one man's giant leap is, is another's uh, you know, questionably incremental step. So I think we need to really reimagine a lot of what we're doing and not be afraid to make bold change and to advocate for bold change. I think we've sort of been lulled into this sense that, um, you know, we, we should uh, sort of think about the, the set of options that are available to us that are sort of feasible at the moment. But I have a feeling that will never get us where we need to go. Um, what are the barriers you face to, to collect data like this? Um, is it lack of motivation or systemic? Where do you see the future of data collection going? Okay, yeah. So, um, so I don't collect this data and actually individual researchers would have a really hard time collecting this data. We really need institutions to do this. So we need uh, people to, um, uh, uh, you know, put institutions to task in saying, you know what, 
um, you need to make sure this is on every health record or l somehow linked to every health record, et cetera. Like there needs to be some way um, that institutions are regularly collecting this data. So that's the first thing. I don't think it's the job of individual researchers. Um, the future of data collection, um, my, my best guess is that the, the, the sort of most straightforward answer, what I actually see happening is the notion of linked data, meaning that there won't be data collection in all these different areas, but the, they will start to make it more possible to collect race data in, in one setting and link it to your health records, to your education records, et cetera. And so uh, my sense is that the future is data linkage. Um, and there are pros and cons to that. Uh, follow up to the med school uh, question. Do you believe this discrimination in med school opportunities starts? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This stuff starts, I mean, in the US it starts in kindergarten. In the US, they have streaming in kindergarten in many places. So this stuff starts very early. It starts with how preschools, teachers and institutions treat you. It starts with what you perceive to be your opportunity structure based on what you see and who you see around you and what their opportunities were. So um, this stuff starts very early. And, and honestly, if you think about the resources that it takes to go to med school, the resources it takes to do post-secondary education, to go to undergrad and then pay for that and pay for med school and so on, um, a lot of people who are able to pay for this do so because their families are able to fund them. So if you look at the largest reason that there are economic differentials between blacks and whites, it's actually not even, it's not because of education, it's not because of income. Those are products of what the biggest issue is, and that is intergenerational transfers of wealth, meaning white families are much more likely to have a stock of wealth that they can give their kids so that their kids, they can pay for their kids' education. They can give them down payments uh, on homes early in life and set them up. And that means they have more education and more income. Again, higher edu like educational differences income differences by race are really a product of wealth differences by race. They don't explain why there are differences. They're actually the outcome of differences. Um, so I think this stuff starts good and early, unfortunately. And so that's what I mean. We have a lot of work to do. There are a lot of institutions that are bound up in all of this. And we have to think really boldly about how to fix that. Um, I don't know how I'm doing for time, Bruce. There's one more question. Uh, you're, you're good still. I think there's two at least two oh, okay, more questions great. or three. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. Wow. Okay. They keep growing. <laughs> <laughs> How would you approach indigenous communities where elders don't want to give healthcare workers help or share their knowledge? I ask as an indigenous nursing student at Algonquin Carleton studying biology, they often tell me to seek, tell me and seek healthcare for, um, help from me, but not from my colleagues. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. I have to say, I don't feel like I have enough um, experience or expertise to give you a very good answer. Um, but I think, you know, we're wise to understand why elders are saying what they're saying. Um, and I think you're wise to kind of analyze that for yourself. Like you probably have a lot more insight on this than I do. I'm sure you do. And so it, I think as you're sort of thinking about why this is happening, I would kind of go with that and, and see if it, it sort of makes sense. Um, but honestly, my other reaction to your question is lack of representation of indigenous um, healthcare professionals. And so if elders have had a long history of experience where, um, you know, they, they experienced a lot of oppression from non-indigenous people, um, it's kind of understandable that they'd be reticent about uh, those people giving them healthcare. Um, and, and it does suggest both that we need more Indigenous healthcare workers and we need to do something about these conditions that keep perpetuating um, that, uh, that, that that kind of caused this, this uh, very understandable mistrust in the first place. <laughs>
Uh, could it be that collecting race-based data itself isn't meaningless, rather the indifferent responses uh, of the system of the issue, uh, response of the system is the issue. Collecting race-based data is necessary. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with that. I think um, the data is not the problem, but it's also not the solution. I think that's the problem is that very often we pose it as the solution. If you collect the data and show the problem, it will fix things. And uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't. Um, so I agree, I agree with the last part of your comment as well. I, I don't think it's that nothing happens and there's no impact. I think it did help people advocate during the pandemic for things like vaccine clinics. Um, and I think we just don't know when it'll come in handy. I think that part of the issue is that, um, we hope that we collect data and then something happens with our data that's positive. And I just don't think that's how policy works. And you're in, you guys are in Ottawa, so you can tell me better uh, than I can tell you. But I think you often have these opportunities where um, change might happen and you have to be ready to advocate and to show the data when that opportunity arises and you just don't know when that will be. So another way to think about this is that it's not this sort of linear continuous way that society works. It's actually kind of this kind of very jagged way where we don't know when change will happen and, and we just sort of have to have knowledge to be ready. Um, are there any instances that you've seen that this data can be used negatively? Yes, absolutely, sure. Uh, and this is one of the concerns. So one of the one of the concerns is, you know, if you're sitting there saying, I, you know, we need this data, and then I can tell you that nothing happened when you collected the data, and I can also tell you that bad things can happen when you collect that data. Um, why are you collecting that data then? So yes, there are uh, instances where where things uh, are negatively framed. So one of them, I think, was that CBC article, which said. Do you think, uh, you know, or I wonder if the uh, racial disparities are uh, socioeconomic or genetic? You know, it reinforces this uh, uh, sort of uh, idea of genetic superiority and inferior inferiority. That's a real harm. And you can argue that part of that happened because we had data of systematic difference. But I think that would happen anyways. Part of my argument has been that the data is not necessarily the reason that's happening, people will find ways to be racist and discriminate, unfortunately. So it's, 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 a, it's a very reasonable comment. Uh, how do we medical professionals, society, media deal with stigmatization of the first group that a pandemic is identified with? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, honestly, I don't know the answer to that. And we did see a rise in anti-Asian uh, um, uh, hate crimes as uh, the pandemic uh, began and sort of was getting going. Um, I think we have to be really vocal about how wrong this is. And I think we have to urge our society to have consequences for people who, um, who sort of engage in this stigmatization and, and worse than just stigmatization, but violence and crime. So both advocating and being vocal about how wrong this is, but also I think being very clear about uh, um, the fact that our society should have consequences for this kind of behavior. Wow. <laughs> what do you think, Bruce? Uh, there's but one minute left. There's, yeah, there's one question's quite short. We might not get through another. There's the- uh, Okay, I'm going to let you the, pick. Well, the definition of streaming, I guess, is pretty quick. Uh, the definition, oh, oh, oh yeah, sorry. That. Okay, um, so what schools do, school systems do is they tell students that, um, or sometimes they don't tell them, but they put students on different tracks of um, education and coursework. So um, you could get put on some kind of an advanced track, or you could put be put on some kind of a regular kind of uh, uh, educational track. Um, so the advanced track might take more math, more science, more et cetera. 
Uh, it might have advanced literature and so on. And the regular track might have sort of more regular, less advanced curricula. Um, or you could be put on a sort of uh, uh, um, a non-academic track, which was what was happening in Ontario, which is a track that is essentially um, uh, not training uh, uh, students in a very rigorously academic way because the assumption is these are students who will go on to do a non-academic, non-intellectual work, uh, or, or at least somewhat non-academic, non-intellectual work. They may become tradespeople and so on. Um, and so when you stream kids into these tracks so early on too, and often against their own desires, you really start to limit their uh, potential. So if I'm in a remedial track, uh, if I get put on a remedial track in ninth grade, the odds of me going to University of Toronto become really, really low. Uh, and I just, I'm just gonna say, I see that comment, uh, why not curtail uh, intergenerational trans, why not? Why not indeed? I'll leave it there. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. We uh, just ran out of time, so that's good timing. So I would like to thank you very much for, for such a nice talk. And I see nice comments in the, uh, the Q&A there from, uh, from colleagues who appreciate the talk as well. Uh, thanks to everybody who helped organize this, the Dean's Office, Maria DeRosa and Rowan Thompson, our uh, assistant dean equity diversity and inclusion who puts this series together and uh, other people that help along the way and uh, i hope to see the rest of you in the audience at some later time for the next event thanks again dr siddiqui thank you thanks so much for having me lovely to be with all of you today <laughs>